I'm Jeff Ward, Principal of Homerton College, Cambridge, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Homerton College's annual Distinguished Lecture. We established this lecture series in 2017 to pay tribute to Dr. Kate Pretty, Principal of the College for the 22 years from 1991 to 2013, who guided a highly rated teacher training college into becoming an institution which was able in 2010 to join the ranks of the University of Cambridge's colleges as its newest member and at the same time its largest. Kate served as president of the Council of British Archaeology from 2008 to 13 and serves now as a member of council of the University of Durham. In Cambridge, she was head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences before and this has resonance for today's lecture, she served from 2004 to 2010 as the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University, responsible for, among other areas, museums and collections. I'm unable to ask Kate to stand and take a bow, but Kate, I know that you're listening from home, and please know how delighted we are to honour your service to college and to university in this way. The inaugural Kate Pretty Lecturer, 2017, was Professor Sir Leszek Borysiewicz, then Vice-Chancellor. In 2018, Pascal Sorio, Chief Executive of AstraZeneca, gave the lecture, and in 2019, the philosopher Honora O'Neill, Baroness O'Neill of Bengal. Circumstances dictated that we postpone the 2020 lecture, and so I'm all the more delighted to welcome tonight's lecturer for having waited. Luke Sison has been director of this, the Fitzwilliam Museum, for a year and a half, having joined us from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where he had oversight of the USA's largest and most comprehensive collection of European applied arts and sculpture. He was involved in the complete refurbishment of the Met's British galleries and created the research and publication program of European sculpture and decorative arts. Prior to joining the Met, Luke was curator of Italian painting before 1500 and head of research at the National Gallery in London, where he led the successful campaign to acquire Raphael's Madonna of the Pinks for the nation. If we were not pandemic afflicted, we would now be gathered in Homerton's auditorium, and I would be able to invite you to a glass of wine in our great hall afterwards. To compensate for that lack, the online format presents several advantages. First, it allows us to reach more people. Well over 400, twice the capacity of our auditorium, have registered, many from overseas. So wherever you are, and whatever time it is, you're very welcome. And while it would certainly be considered impolite for the audience to chat during an in-person lecture, this evening I encourage you to make enthusiastic use of the online capital C chat function to comment and share your thoughts. Separately, at the bottom of the chat box, you'll see the facility to ask a question. Q&A and chat are separate. At the end of the lecture, I'll be putting to Luke the questions that you submit using the Ask button. And again, please don't be shy. You can ask those questions at any time, and I'll gather them up at the end. Finally, depending on what equipment you're using to view the lecture, you might see three dots in the top right-hand corner of the chat box and be able to pop out the chat into a new window. And at the bottom right of the video, you might see a button which will allow you to view this in full screen. This will depend on the technology you're using, so I invite you to experiment. Luke and I won't notice, and we won't mind. So, as principal of Homerton, and also as chair of the Fitzwilliam Museum Syndicate, it gives me the greatest pleasure to invite Luke Sison to deliver his lecture why does a university need an art collection making the most of the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge? 
Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. It's an enormous pleasure and indeed a great honor to be your lecturer um, this evening. Because we're not able to join you in person, we thought we'd take advantage of, um, of a new, the new format and, um, and actually explore the fits in different spaces with, with different objects. So I've pre-recorded this lecture. We'll be back at the end of it to answer your questions, as Jeff has just described, and I'm really looking forward um, to our conversation. But for the moment, please watch the video. The Fitzwilliam Museum has just opened its doors again for the first time since Christmas, and I can't tell you how wonderful that feels. All these months of emptiness have demonstrated unequivocally that a museum is not completely a museum without its visitors without people, and even the works of art take on an unexpected melancholy without their audience. But I have to say that we've waited longer than we wanted, given a date of May the 18th as part of a third tranche of government's roadmap, after gyms, non-essential retail, pub gardens, tattoo parlours. Although a few people questioned that wisdom, there was, it must be said, a disappointingly muted response from the public. No large-scale outcry, seemingly very little sense of loss. I've actually been worried for some time that going to museums is not an activity sufficiently ingrained into most people's lives and that the sector is heading for a crisis. Now I think that the events of the last few months reveal that we're already bang in the middle of one. But I also believe that this is a challenge the Fitzwilliam Museum is peculiarly equipped to tackle precisely because of its place in the University of Cambridge. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. And in doing so, I want to answer the question in my title in a slightly different way, to ask why might a great collection and a great university need each other? And how, by working collaboratively, might we point the way ahead? When the Fitz was founded in 1816 with the bequest of the 7th Viscount Fitzwilliam's collection of paintings, prints and manuscripts, he proclaimed that the museum he envisaged would be for the purpose of promoting the increase of learning and other great objects of that noble foundation, that is the University of Cambridge. Lucilla Byrne's recent history of the Fitzwilliam charts two centuries of struggle to understand and realise his intention. The museum has often in the past been perceived as an add-on by university academics, the kitten story at the end of the real news, and the museum has sometimes held itself aloof from the rest of the university, grandly embittered in its tent. And the problem was exacerbated by the fact that there was, until quite recently, so little to latch onto in terms of the university's teaching, or indeed, for the most part, the incorporation of object study into those disciplines already in place in Cambridge. Nonetheless, the collection steadily grew, thanks largely to the pride and piety of university graduates, and then to the love affairs between passionate private collectors and the museum that resulted, always, though, within the determined cultural confines of the global north. There have been two main schools of thought within the university. One is represented in the 1850s by William Hewell, Vice-Chancellor, Master of Trinity and Chairman of the Fitzwilliam Syndicate, who, opposing the acquisition of the now much-valued Leake Collection, stated firmly, a collection of coins can never be an object of interest to the public in general, and called the museum a place of public engagement and display. So much for numismatic scholarship. In 1875, on the other hand, theologian F.G.A. Hort, debating the appointment of a new director, proclaimed, the object of the university should be to make the museum an integral part of its educational work and not merely a magnificent toy. With a view to this, the director chosen must be a helpful man, ready to work into the whole system of the university. So a public asset and a scholarly tool. The task now is to make what have often been seen as opposite ambitions into the same effort. Visitors to the city, indeed its own inhabitants, are greeted by the university with mostly closed doors. The university, let alone its work, can feel closed off and inaccessible, and that's particularly worrying in such an unequal part of Britain. The Fitzwilliam Museum, as it stands, appears physically to confirm the character of the university, a grand facade, terrifyingly empty lawns, lots and lots and lots of things to see, 
whose importance is assumed rather than proclaimed. We're already beginning to change that through the work going on behind the scenes. In its next phase, I want the museum to provide a public face for the university that reflects what we know ourselves to be, open, adventurous, thought-provoking. And even more than a door into the university, the museum should be a two-way bridge between the academic community and the world it inhabits. Looking ahead, it is crucial, we think, that our research should be audience-led and our public engagement research-led, to give people of all kinds experiences of the past that will inform our futures. We have an extraordinary archive of the human made here in Cambridge, and people, their beliefs, creativity, actions and interactions sit at the heart of all we should be doing. And what should that be? I don't want this talk to become too abstract, so let's dive into the collection and get just a flavour of the thinking that arises from the objects we care for. I want to start with a group of works that illuminate cultures where documents and commentaries never existed, or that give voice to those often expunged from the historical record. This is the oldest object in the Fitzwilliam, a chip of limestone with inscribed on it uh, the form of a reindeer. A very, very small object, made, we think, around 14,000 years ago, found in the Dordogne. It's, um, it's got a kind of energy and, um, of description here, which is really remarkable. The, the reindeer looks back over his shoulder, or maybe he's even scratching um, his back. Um, and there's a kind of movement as well, which is, which is really remarkable. People have come up with all sorts of theories as to what these might be for, whether they're uh, ritual objects or perhaps even hand warmers and um, put in the, in the fire to absorb heat. And one can imagine how chilly life in the Dordogne was in those days. But in the end, what they are is visual evidence and really the only evidence of what people saw, how they saw, and how they observed, what they thought was important. Um, and so whether this was made by a professional artist, if that's even the, an appropriate word at this date, or by somebody doing the equivalent of, of whittling a, a, a stick, we don't know. But what we do know is that, is that this was part of the fabric of the life of Homo sapiens at the point where we're really beginning to trace our own histories and our own visual culture. Is this art? Well, who knows? Is it magical? Unquestionably. And I use the word magical, which doesn't feel as if it has quite the requisite academic distance. I wasn't really intending to, but I think it does speak to the power of objects. Holding this Queen Victoria penny in my hand is unexpectedly touching. On the front, it looks perfectly ordinary. There's the queen in profile. But on the back, this piece has been inscribed, Votes for Women, punched across the figure of Britannia. So this coin gives voice to the suffragette movement, struggling to make themselves heard at precisely this moment. And Britannia feels as if she's been recruited for the, for the cause. Over the last few years, with the help of the Art Fund, Richard Kelleher has put together a really telling collection of coins of this kind, stamped with slogans or defaced as a protest against the, the state. It's a project we're calling Currencies of Conflict and Dissent, and that will um, give rise to an exhibition in a couple of years' time. Some of this history feels rather long ago now, but for me at least, these coins stamped with, for example, the letters IRA across the, the figure of um, Elizabeth II on this 50 pence piece, or UVF across this Irish salmon, are redolent of my, of my childhood. Growing up in the 70s and 80s, the troubles in Ireland were a, a background to our lives. Now, of course, for many of the students arriving in Cambridge, this is as good as ancient history. So unless we preserve and explain objects like this one, then we're, we're not going to be able to, to touch people's lives with a history that is still profoundly relevant. 
These were probably made using the letter punches that were used to mark machinery in, in workshops, and so perhaps that machinery was being used illicitly in the lunch hour. And the coins circulated across the Irish-Irish border in the counties on either side of it. So these were a form of portable graffiti. Lots of different slogans were, were, were stamped into coins at this time. And they're also, of course, statements of loyalty to one side or the other. Traditionally, art museums have placed fine arts at the top of their hierarchy, painting and sculpture, drawings and prints, by great named artists, and ideally with a history of ownership that secures their prestige. Certainly when the Fitzwilliam proudly and not unreasonably proclaims its status as the greatest university art collection in the world, it's thinking about what we would have traditionally called masterpieces, works by Titian, Rubens and Rembrandt, by Constable, Turner and Blake, or by Monet, Degas, Rodin and Renoir. I want to come back to these canonical works, not least because I'm conscious that the reasons I find them exciting are less and less extraordinary for many of our visitors. Ceramics, on the other hand, are much cosier, and their kind of normality, um, the, the familiarity of their shapes, brings them into reach of the, the ordinary visitor. Our front of house team actually have told me that those visitors who are put off by Titian and Co upstairs warm to the English pottery that they find on our lower floor galleries. It was a collection that was pretty much kicked off by um, a, an extraordinary figure, J.W.L. Glacier, who was a, a mathematician, a pure mathematician at, at Trinity, and who in his retirement formed a collection of English pottery, the kind of earthy antithesis of his mathematical speculation, one can't help feeling. And this piece, in a way, is, is absolutely typical of that collection. Um, I love it as much as anything else because it contains some fantastic contradictions. What we're seeing here is um, the depiction of Charles II, uh, just back from exile in a long black wig, and his queen, Catherine of Braganza, with um, a lot of very stylized curls. Um, it was made in Staffordshire. It's signed proudly by the slightly actually mysterious Thomas Toft. And it's, it's, it's absolutely uninnovative. It's made using local materials, using a technique called slipware, which goes back to the Middle Ages and indeed before. And what we have, I think, is a, a, a statement about British character at this moment, a statement of pride in making, that's what that toft signature indicates, of industry, of earthiness, of, of modesty, of loyalty to the crown, not necessarily very visually sophisticated, and looking backwards, really, rather than, than forwards. And all of that, I think, is, is, um, is something that we can discuss now in a way that Glacier, when he first gave us these pieces, would probably only have seen this as an example of the history of, of the evolution of English pottery. Before the pandemic, I walked past this gourd-shaped pot, like a teapot, um, every day. And every time I looked at it, I was astonished again by how old it is. This green glazed stoneware flourished in Korea between the 10th and the 14th centuries, encouraged by the Koryo dynasty, and at a moment when um, a kind of aristocratic hierarchical Buddhism was the, was the order of the day. It's the same moment, we have to remember, that English medieval potters were making things of the kind that, frankly, any of us could make in a, in a pottery class. So here, the modernity, the stripped-down quality of this piece, its, its elegance, its sophistication, demands some explanation. Um, and I guess the question really is, is does, this, does this sense of its calm, of its absolute rightness, result from the cultural context in which it was made, and in particular from the religious and meditative practices of the day? Or are we at a moment where this has become so important in all of our lives, anachronistically looking back. Well, what do we really know about this pot? We know that it's a technique that was imported from China. It was made for uh, certainly an elite member of Korean society. What we do know is that tea drinking was part of clearing the mind, being able to get to a point where you could allow larger thoughts than just the, the sort of daily concerns that we all have into, into, your, into your life and into your mind. 
you have to wonder whether the different stages of its making, from being formed, glazed, decorated, fired, each of those moments with enormous risk to the object have something to do with the, the pathway to enlightenment. Well, that may be a step too far, but for me at least, this is an object as much about Korea in the, in the 13th century as it is for us now. Just as with Korean stoneware, Islamic lustered pottery provides another chapter in an alternative history of technology, one that prioritizes non-European contributions. The value of these objects doesn't lie in their raw materials, but in the ingenuity of their making. This underpinning of the visual and material cultures of Islamic communities is surely an area for urgent consideration. Muslim artistic traditions need to be understood as propelling the cultural evolution of humanity as a whole. Sadly, this huge contribution is not yet fully appreciated in Europe and the West, and in what we can agree is a period of increasing international tension, this is the moment to explore the richness and diversity of the Islamic world. Unlike in Roman or Christian Europe, ceramics were not an also-ran medium in medieval Syria or Persia. In fact, the Hadiths forbade the use of gold and silver at the table, and so the elite needed to find other solutions to, to demonstrate their wealth and their, their power, and what they did was to turn to, to pottery. And that pottery gains its value not through the raw materials, but by the virtue of the ingenuity that went into the pursuit of, of, of beauty. This piece, I think, is, is absolutely emblematic of that. Perhaps one can imagine it laden with the, the kinds of fish that swim so fluidly and beautifully across its surface little um, base clef gills and, and comb-like hatching. I love the bubbles um, in the luster in between. But making something like this was, was not a, an easy task. And in 1301, Abul Qasim wrote a treatise which demonstrates just how hard it was to make something like this. He shows how the potter chemists had gone out into the mountains finding mines and quarries with the right ores and minerals to grind down, to burn, to powder like coal, to apply to these um, extraordinary dishes. And it was that scientific ingenuity that the first owners of these pieces really appreciated. I can't help feeling that these were people with minds and hands as fluid and quick as the fish that shimmer across the surface of this dish. This selection has been driven in part, I must admit, by my desire to get up close to a number of my favourite things here at the Fitz after all these months. But I hope they give a sense of the museum's power to transport, of the ways our closed minds can unfurl when faced by the immediacy, the, the sheer beauty of our encounter with works of art. These remain critical concepts in an environment which is often too pragmatic, too frenetic, too target driven, and indeed in a university where we can become too discipline bound. But a museum that relies on just that power can become too passive, sitting there, just waiting to be discovered. Being transported, opening a door is wonderful, but to where and to what? Shouldn't the museum be actively arranging the transport and charting the course? 30 years ago, this very month, I started my curatorial career in the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum joining an institution that really embodied a definition of museum substantially unchanged since the late 19th century. A very large and grand building containing a huge number of often remarkable objects looked after by curators. The curator's job was to build their own knowledge of the things in their care to become themselves repositories of information available for consultation but mainly for those already sufficiently interested. Discussion about how to make this more accessible by a non-scholarly public was just getting going, but not with the idea that curator's research should be in any way shaped by audience needs or wishes. These interactions were the responsibilities of other teams in education, 
or the editors of labels, essentially boltons, who needed the curators for information, but whose place in the institutional hierarchy was perceived as lower. We were handing out information like gruel in a workhouse, albeit with some of the lumps strained out, because we believed, without much in the way of self-reflection, it was good for our visitors to know more. In other words, a fundamental assumption that building up areas of knowledge about the past is valuable for its own sake remained unchallenged, and the idea that our past might be made difficult or larger or more complex had not yet arisen. We were still working, in other words, in the 18th century world that had created the British Museum in the first place. I don't know why my own study of 15th century Italian historians didn't shape my purpose more. These were humanists, and the clue is in the name, who gathered and assessed information about the classical past, seeking models and counter-models as to how people should be living then and how they might move forward. This is a view of the past that I want to come back to. There were the beginnings, too, of long-term mutterings about value for public money, and meanwhile things were going on in the outside world. The internet has created an alternative, much easier method for satisfying curiosity. And for a number of reasons, younger generations feel an increasing sense of separation from the past as technological change has made historical experience more remote and as fundamental assumptions underpinning traditional readings of the past have changed. And more than that, new entertainments provided on screens have changed our relationship with places and things. These shifts were obscured or muffled in museums by the rise of mass tourism, cheap flights to pilgrimage destinations that keep visitor numbers high, so museums, and perhaps curators in particular, were slow to respond to the point where their expertise now feels less and less valuable within organisations where footfall, income generation and comms come too easily to the top of the minds of museum directors. And the directors themselves are often recruited these days with a lack of faith that is telling in itself from outside the museum world. So, 30 years on, the context for what we're doing at a museum feels very different. The current challenge to arts and humanities in particular is very great, as the government's proposed 50% cut in funding to the teaching of disciplines like archaeology um, clearly demonstrates. We should welcome, I think, uh, the increasing emphasis on research impact, encouraging us to think what difference we make to individuals and to society. We are too often perceived as an elite institution divorced from the needs, interests and concerns of communities. In recent months, the museums have also become a principal battleground in the so-called culture wars. While some have emphasised the dangers of an unquestioning Eurocentric tradition, others seek to defend the historical status quo. This is incredibly difficult territory, but it's one we absolutely can't shy away from. The recent upheavals in American museums as staff and boards realise that they've done much too little for much too long to address the lack of diversity in their arts and narratives is less seismic here, not least because funding bodies, including government, have identified this priority some years back. This is not a time for complacency, though. There's much more to be done, not least at a time when politicians and commentators are inclined to express their anxieties about museums becoming too woke. One of the buzz phrases of the moment is disputed heritage, but the irony here is that actually visitors don't seem very interested in entering into a dispute or even coming at all. That's partly because the whole experience of the museum feels less and less relevant for many. It's partly because these discussions have become so polarised and polarising. Key to our approach, the starting point for any discussion, is the realisation that objects can contain multiple narratives that they're susceptible to various forms of interrogation and interpretation, and that histories can coexist in a single work in ways that aren't always neat and comfortable. So how, especially by working with the vast resource of curious minds in Cambridge, can we become a place where people know that there isn't a single simple right answer, where a nuanced argument doesn't imply a compromised or evasive one, and where, as we make efforts to expand and challenge traditional narratives, 
it's made clear that this is not about completely sweeping them away. How do we equip people not only to have thoughtful, inclusive discussions about the objects of the past, but also to understand that the tangled, contradictory histories that these objects embody, the many decisions, impulses, prejudices and assumptions they enshrine, are mirrored in the things we do now, that we live out our pasts today and we can only change our futures by understanding that. At the FITS, we now have two main projects that intertwine in analysing particular works of art or groups of objects. The first is to provide expansive glimpses of all humankind from across the globe, of human behaviour, impulse and interactions, of our thought and belief systems, and the ways in which we inhabit the planet. The objects encountered might be deeply considered works of art by thoughtful and inspired artists, or the more unmediated detritus of daily life. Often they're a combination of the two. The tracing of common threads and the anatomizing of cultural or historical difference and change is key. And so too is the very particular immediacy of the objects themselves, tangible links with pasts and cultures, and frequently constituting a nexus of connection for overlapping communities. The second is to promote our visual and material literacy to support a better understanding of the ways in which images and objects shape our thinking. 80% of our information is taken in through our eyes, and yet this process remains alarmingly under-analysed. And what happens when we don't see or we don't look, when artists and other makers ignored what was happening? Conversely, how could and can image-making puncture ignorance or obliviousness? How can it mislead? And can something that's edited or distorted be actually more truthful than something simply recorded? Putting together the histories of objects and the analysis of their appearances takes us to places of complexity, where objects embody entanglements of what we often term good or bad, where polarised reactions are challenged, where beauty or technological innovation or human love, kindness and compassion coexist with things that were always or are now understood as deplorable. Objects therefore provide rather simple routes into complexity because so much can be embedded in a single piece. Ultimately, they can help us understand that it's almost impossible to stand apart or aloof or to see issues too simply. This then is about understanding the complexity of decision-making in the real world. And it's about helping us understand that our cultural inheritances and assumptions might be deeply inbuilt rather than immediately evident. How do we prevent this being just more top-down stuff? Our effort can't be just more gruel. Some projects are particularly urgent at the moment, but what's the point of just preaching to the choir, or indeed alienating those who are inclined to disagree in advance? We want museums to be places of debate for everyone, not just for the confident. This is where our learning and public engagement teams come in, but this also demands a change of mindset that suggests their involvement from the beginning of research projects, and indeed suggests a new way of thinking among the researchers themselves. What we're envisaging here is the involvement of audiences from the off as we formulate our research questions. At the moment, the Cambridge Museums, the Fitzwilliam among them, is envisaging a very large overarching project that forges strong links between objects researchers and their audiences, both actual and potential. We've called this project Collections, Connections, Communities. It's important to emphasise that this is very much a collective effort, but here I must say that the project is being put together by Rebecca Kilner at the Zoology Museum and our own Deputy Director for Collections and Research, Neil Spencer, who's recently arrived um, from the British Museum. I'm going to focus here on the human made as both the area of the Fitz's own responsibility and of my own expertise. But our equal collaboration with the science collections will be key to the success of this enterprise. These are the kinds of questions we want to ask. How do art and objects of the past create communities and shape individual identities within them? How can public health and well-being be improved through engagement with collections? How might they contribute to people's sense of their place in this world, of their understanding and critical nous, as well as their responsibilities and, yes, pleasures? 
How might the complex and entangled histories of collections be used to address persistent societal inequalities now and in the future? Which parts of our voluminous collections have been insufficiently valued and what should we do now to respond to this neglect or hierarchy? I want to come back now to some of our current projects and to look at some of the objects that have inspired them. These will, I hope, give some sense of the threads that will run through this Cambridge-wide Grand Projet. I'm taking you back in time now to near the beginning of our extraordinary ceramics collection to Cyprus um, in the year around 700 BC. And I'm here with one of our great pieces on loan from Corpus Christi College, a, a jug, a, a vessel. We don't know exactly what was kept in it, but we do know that uh, a, an elite inhabitant of Cyprus prized this enough to use it during his lifetime and to take it with him into his grave. It's a work that sits at the heart of our Being an Islander project, a project in which we're looking at the ancient cultures of Sardinia, uh, Crete and Cyprus, up to and including the invasion of the Romans. So as we look at the culture of ancient Cyprus, we're thinking about an island where the Greeks settled and traded and where there were also considerable um, links with, with Egypt, with Phoenicia, um, with areas that are now would be southwest Turkey and, um, and Syria. What in the end we're looking at then is something which um, could only happen in Cyprus, but could only happen in Cyprus because um, of, what, of the people who, who, who settled there and who traded with indigenous Cypriots. It looks distinctively Cypriot precisely because of its hybridity. Being an Islander was a project dreamt up by Anastasia Christofilopoulou at the height of the Brexit debate, the impact of which will be felt for years to come. Our questions might equally be about gender or, or sexual orientation. We've just opened with a display of some of our most familiar 20th century works by Hepworth, Riley, Gwen John, Picasso, Stanley Spencer and Modigliani, where the room divides between works created by women and those made by men depicting women. I was also very pleased when we reopened Gallery 3 in 2019 to have hanging so prominently Carlo Dolce's paired 1660s portraits of John Finch and John Baines, companions for life, buried together in Cambridge where they met in an unbroken marriage of souls. And now, finally receiving proper attention, are issues of race and racism, of identity, of exclusion, but also resistance. This time it was the university's inquiry into the legacies of enslavement here in Cambridge that inspired our project, and I'm delighted that Jake Richards is leading it. Though so tiny, this piece will figure large in our exhibition on the legacies of enslavement. What I'm holding here is Josiah Wedgwood's famous 1787 medallion or cameo produced in very large quantities um, in the decades around um, 1800 uh, that did so much to persuade people of the abhorrence of the slave trade. And in fact, it's based on the emblem of the society for effecting the abolition of the slave trade with the slogan, the famous slogan, am I not a man and a brother? Josiah Wedgwood was a convinced abolitionist and one of his fellows, John Newton, a convert to the cause who wrote Amazing Grace, included the line, was blind, but now I see. That sense of revelation that the visual can, can give. Wedgwood's medallion punctured the complacency of British society and converted many to the cause. He wasn't alone. Cambridge abolitionist Thomas Clarkson filled a chest with powerful objects and images that he used during his lectures to persuade his audience of the appalling crime of, of slavery. But though this object is so powerful, it actually renders the person represented on it less powerful. And that's a problem. The abolitionist cause was not itself 
immune from racism in this period. And this pose, although it comes respectably from ancient coins, depicts a person of colour in a subservient, pleading pose, giving all the power to this piece's white audience. So is this object simply good because it did so much to promote the abolitionist cause, or bad because of the way in which it portrays the enslaved African? Or is it actually both, good and bad? What it can't be is, is neither. These two aspects live together in a single object, and this is the complexity which makes it difficult to explain, but somehow even more powerful and resonant today than it might be if we were simply celebrating it um, as a, a triumph of white abolitionism. We've always seen, but somehow not seen, Fanny Eaton. And one of the really glorious things of the last 18 months or so is her re-emergence into the public eye, into the public imagination. She was a muse, a model for the pre-Raphaelites, for Rossetti, um, for Millet, and for Simeon Solomon, who executed these incredibly beautiful drawings um, that I'm sitting next to. She was born in Jamaica. Her mother was a freed slave. Um, her father was a slightly mysterious Englishman. And she came to England with her mother and met a cabbie uh, with whom she had, in the end, um, 10 children. But what makes her special, and what makes her really remarkable, was her role as a professional model. She sat for um, members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood between around 1859 and the mid-1860s. And it's her rediscovery by a number of feminist art historians and actually by her own descendants that has really allowed us to see the paintings in which she appears in a, in a completely different light. They take on a new richness when we understand them as evidence of the presence of black people in England and their participation in, in English cultural life. It's been really exciting to see how she's been celebrated in this last year in magazines, online, in a wonderful poem written by Jackie Kay. But the story is not simple. In these drawings, in these beautiful drawings, she is just who she is. In the paintings, she can appear in all sorts of modes as a main protagonist, as a bystander, but really often celebrated more as a generic exotic than um, for being the beautiful Jamaican woman that, that she was. And when she finished being useful to the pre-Raphaelites, perhaps when the effort of um, ch childcare and maintaining her job as a char lady, as well as a professional model, got too much, she disappears again from the public record. So this wasn't an equal relationship, and it wasn't necessarily even a respectful relationship. And although it's a, an affirmative history in many ways, it's also a complex one. And that's the thing I think that these drawings so beautifully enshrine. As the Cambridge Museums plan the Legacies of Empire and Enslavement project, introducing systems of co-curation and co-creation will be essential. Community scrutiny and involvement, including from Cambridge's student population, will shape the project in ways that will make it richer and more meaningful for more people. Josiah Wedgwood, though a mere potter, is a hero of European art. His medallion has entered the canon. And our approach to this object should now be extended to others of our, quote, treasures. We need to rethink some of our best known images, works like Artitians, the traditional pride and joy of the European Art Museum. And in doing so, um, and as we ponder them anew, we need to understand them as extraordinary events in our cultural history. For a traditional museum, a painting by Titian of this scale and this importance is a much longed for prize. And ever since this came to us as a 100th birthday present um, in the 1920s, to become a companion to the Titian that Fitzwilliam himself gave us, it's been celebrated as a masterpiece. 
looked at as an example of Titian's late technique, and his extraordinary freedom of, of paint, of brushstroke, and so on. So, a masterpiece, but a very, very complicated one. Art historians in the past have tended not to focus very hard on the subject matter. And when they have, and I have to say most of them have been male, they've tended to put this painting into the category of erotica. It shows the rape of Lucretia by Tarquin, the moment when the son of the king of Rome sexually assaulted the wife of one of the city's great nobles. It was the event that caused the collapse of the ruling dynasty. What does having this picture on the walls of a university museum allow us to do today? Well, I think it's two things. One is to think hard about Titian's intentions and the context in which this picture was made. And the other is to think about what the ramifications for the way in which we look at images or film or TV today. Titian painted this picture um, for the King of Spain, Philip II, his greatest patron at the end of his life. And it was the last of a series of female nudes that was sent to the king from Venice. So is this a piece of erotica or is there something more profound, more sympathetic going on here? When you look closely, Titian's clearly concentrated on the pain, the agony of this assaulted woman. And he concentrates his paint in the tears that fall down her cheeks. There's a sympathy here, but at the same time, there's a form of voyeurism that's happening. And when you think about how often those two things of ostensible sympathy and actual voyeurism are combined in image making today, this painting stands at the head of an extraordinary tradition and a troubling one. Ultimately then, our question must be, how do we talk about something? How do we learn if we don't look and see? And most importantly of all, see things differently and more completely. I've been struck recently by two things I read. One emerged from my previous role at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where they've been conducting a visitor survey of the new British galleries, in particular the Tea, Trade and Empire Room. A Brooklyn visitor, interviewed earlier this year, said, I loved the beautiful British teapots, although I felt conflicted about them too, considering their context. That's seeing things differently. That's thinking two things at once. And in a very different context, in Darby English's How to See a Work of Art in Total Darkness, he writes, Glenn Ligon's text paintings affirm the necessity of remaining in rather than resolving contradiction. And that's a comment I can only applaud. I want to finish by giving you a preview of a very large project for the future. As part of our proposed Collections, Connections, Communities research initiative, the university collections, the fits among them, want to ask another crucial question, a question for now. How do we bring together pictorial records, specimens, and reflections of the natural world including the ways they document loss and destruction, to understand and mitigate against today's global environmental challenges. One early Fitzwilliam ingredient of this project will be Jane Monroe's exhibition True to Nature, a title that implies a question mark that will open next year and will invite contributions from many parts of the university. It's an exhibition principally of 19th century oil sketches made in the open air or purporting to be. It will help us understand how attitudes to nature, reflected in the art of the past, shape our attitudes now, how they document our environment and our own shaping of it, how the different ingredients of landscape can be viewed romantically, scientifically, spiritually, or all at once, and how those attitudes inform the ways in which we seek to preserve or recreate real landscapes today. The question of the emotional impact of nature sits behind the project led by Kate Noble our senior research associate in the learning department. It's called Inspire Nature, and she's working with primary school teachers. The project grew during conversations with Jane Monroe about her show and her thinking behind it. Kate was particularly struck by Jane's interest in seeing how people connect with nature through art, of how she wants the exhibition to stimulate and encourage a more considered and mindful engagement with the world around us. 
All of this feels particularly relevant post-COVID when so many of us have found solace in, in nature. The FITS had over 100 bookings for the five teacher training sessions that took place in February and March. And the programme had also strong well-being benefits for teachers during an extremely stressful and difficult time. Their initial feedback has, I think, fully demonstrated the value of this interdisciplinary approach as a way of opening up conversations about art, objects and the natural world. So I hope you'll indulge me if I read out just a few of their comments. This is so inspiring and allows for me as an art teacher to think about multiple aspects of a theme, science, geography and so on, not just from an art point of view. I will be bringing pieces of beautiful artwork into my science lessons and I'd never thought of photographing the trees in my school grounds every month and plotting their changes over a, a day, a week, a month, a year. Such a simple and beautiful idea. The Impressionist painter of landscape, Claude Monet, was unconventionally taught and so is actually rather a good model for primary school children and their teachers. I want to finish my tour of the fits standing in front of one of his paintings that is, like Artitians, very much part of the canon. A Landscape of Poplars by Monet. What could be lovelier than a Monet? I'm standing next to one of the Fitzwilliam's most purely beautiful pictures, one of a series of paintings of poplars that Monet painted in 1891, partly from a boat that he moored in the middle of uh, the river Ebt near his home in Giverny. It's an incredibly seductive scene, but is it actually disguising uh, a reality that in a university museum it's our duty to unpick? When we understand, for example, that the poplars were due to be cut down, that Monet not only bought them, but bought them in partnership with a lumber merchant, then we have a completely different reading of this picture. And suddenly this beautiful slice of nature feels precarious and feels commercially threatened. This comes at the end of the, of the 19th century, that age of industry, which in other paintings Monet was happy to explore. In this, he seems to give us an idea of unmediated light, of weather, of the time of the day. But actually, one could read it as a mask for a much more uncomfortable reality, a reality where the beauty of the French landscape was ever more threatened. Poplars were used for making paper, for making crates, for plywood. This is not a grand uh, wood in any way. And somehow its commercial use, as it underpins the meaning of this picture, changes it. It reminds us of how precarious nature is as it's exploited by, by man. And it actually implicates the painter himself. Luke, thank you so much for that. This audience tonight will be full of habitués of the Fitzwilliam, but everyone will have seen, will have heard something new and also heard and seen new things about familiar pieces. So thank you so much. It was a wonderful lecture. And questions are landing in my hand as I speak. The first is from Steve Watts. Thank you, Steve, who has given you a fascinating analysis of the splendours of Islamic art what does that do to rebuke critiques of museums as plunder houses? Jeff, I think that's a really important question. As I've been trying to say, the individual histories of each object are crucial in understanding their entire meaning. So I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a, a balance here between um, owning up to unequal relationships which have uh, resulted in works coming here, and then understanding their power in, um, in the context of a, of a museum in Britain. The, the key here, I think, is to make sure that um, what we don't do is sort of hug it to ourselves as being somehow a, a sort of trophy, um, and, and, that, and our, that our discussion of these works, and indeed our, our ability to uh, allow them to travel around the world, or even where appropriate, um, to, to give them back, uh, is, is dictated 
not just by the circumstances of the collecting, but determined by conversations that we're having with, with people from the parts of the world from which these objects come. So, um, in my, to my mind, it it's really comes to the to heart of what I've been saying, which is that there isn't usually a simple answer that fits every object. It's much more important to realize that... Um, that, that, the, that those contradictions that reside in the objects will, will be resolved in different ways according to their nature and the kinds of, and the kinds of conversations that we can have um, internationally. And of course, being in Cambridge gives us a particular kind of power in, in, in that respect um, the, the res because, because the conversations will be based on research. And I think that's the key, the key ingredient here. Thank you. Very different kind of question from Katie Grundy. Thank you, Katie. 10, 20, 30 years into the future, what next for the Fitz? Gosh, that's an enormous question and one that probably would demand a, a huge lecture um, even uh, in its own right. Um, but I suppose what I've been thinking about hard is how to maintain um, a kind of 19th century authority that belongs within this part of the, of the building um, and combine it with um, a, a much more experimental mode, where, in a sense, we become a kind of fit art and, 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 and material culture lab, um, not just for the university, but for, um, for the community and, and, inter and locally, internationally and nationally. And I think that's the, the key. And then the result, I think, of what people will see, I hope, I mean, this is you know, the idea, is, is spaces that have very different characters. So some like the, the space we're in, where that kind of grandeur, um, but also intimacy, um, mm. something that a, applies in a kind of country house, the country house hang and, and, and the Victorian, the great Victorian museum design can coexist with a building at the South End, which, is, which, which, which has that experimental character, where, where that sense of how researchers and communities come together to interrogate objects, and where that sense of what I was talking about of you know, the focus on visual and material literacy can be explored in, as I say, kind of lab conditions almost. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you've taken us into the future. Can we go a little bit back into the past as well with a question from Beverly Glover? Thank you, Beverly, who asks, did your founder collect strategically, actually foreseeing future social and intellectual value, and can you? Again, a, a, a fascinating question. My feeling is that Viscount Fitzwilliam was collecting in ways that were absolutely typical of an aristocratic grandee at that moment, so great um, Renaissance paintings, Dutch pictures, and so on. His, um, his particular interest, though, in musical and medieval manuscripts does single him out. And that sense of where a, a, a painting's display and a, and a library meet um, does suggest some sense that when he was talking about the promotion of learning, that he, he, it wasn't just persiflage, that it was, there was something um, real about it. Exactly what he thought would happen with these pieces, I, I don't know. And I can't believe that he really collected except for his own pleasure. But perhaps what he did see was the potential and so in the end, I think that's sort of the, the answer now, pleasure and, and potential. Um, ev almost every object has the capacity to provoke questions, to make us think anew, um, and to be interrogated from the sort of vast disciplinary array that Cambridge University has. And so, you know, I think you never, you never want to count out an object um, because um, somehow it's not interesting to us that, uh, at this moment, and, and you know, and individual collectors who, who continue to help us build the collection here, um, their individual pleasures still matter. Can we do something more strategic? Yes, I think we can. I mean, I think there are areas, for example, where narratives have not been fully expanded or explored, and those are to do with, um, with the focus on what was thought of as great art in... Uh, in a museum in around sort of 1900 in a place like Cambridge. So we are absolutely now focusing on making our story bigger by what we acquire. Um, 
whether that be works from the past or more and more um, contemporary works, particularly by artists of color and others who have, would be, have previously been excluded from a museum yes. like this one. Yes. Um, I should just note that this event was scheduled to run till seven o'clock, uh, and it is now seven. However, for anybody who can stay just a little longer, there is, I think, time for just a few more questions. And one flows directly from the end of your answer to the last, I think, which is a question from Christy Bain, who asks, what do you feel the Fitzwilliam offers uniquely to the national and international legacies of enslavement initiatives? So I suppose one thing um, that we can be upfront about is what the history of the Fitzwilliam itself says about, um, about the money that was made through the slave trade. Viscount Fitzwilliam's collection and his wealth, to some degree, came from the Decker family, his in-laws, um, and Matthew Decker was involved in the, in the slave trade. Um, we, therefore, have uh, a duty, it seems to me, at the Fitzwilliam to investigate our own history within this context. And I think that what uh, we're hoping to do is using the museum's history and those and parts of uh, other parts of the university is to is to understand how um, how profit came to a, a place like this um, with a sort of background of. Um, against the background of, well, it's sort of over there and it's not connected and it's not real. And I think what we're doing is bringing the reality of that back into our discourse in ways that I think, and, and importantly, must help us understand who we are now um, as, as a leading in, uh, uh, educational institution in, in not just in Britain, but in the world. What mm. are our, I mean, that word legacies is, is the key one mm. here. Mm. What, do we, um, what have we inherited and what do we need to do now to fix some of the, that inheritance? A very different kind of question from Georgina Cannon. How can we harness the power, popularity, and currency of visual social media like Instagram to engage younger audiences in particular? Well, Jeff, I think it's, it's both a different question and the same one, actually, because it goes back to this kind of question of, of historical context and visual literacy. Um, the lovely thing about Instagram, which I must admit I really enjoy as a medium, is that it's picture-led. Um, and even the pictures of people's cappuccinos or their cats still have power in those people's lives and help us understand those people better, or at least the image that they want to project. So actually, as a medium for the communication of images, it's, it's perfect. The other thing I love about it is it's participatory. So one, what gives me huge pleasure when I post on Instagram, which I've been doing, I must say, during lockdown less regularly than I used to, um, but because I've been seeing less, um, but is, is the, is the in invitation to a conversation. Um, so if you've asked a question that sparks a thought, then Instagram and other, uh, allows, a, allows a conversation to happen in an atmosphere which I think is... is um, not combative, but um, on, for, on for the most part, but inclusive. And um, I think that's really important. So what I'm not good at, I know, is, um, is writing pithily, and I'm not good at writing in a way that uh, engages people, frankly, of different generation from, from mine, at least not very good. Um, and I think that's where specialist teams come in and, and helping um, uh, curators translate their thoughts and ideas into that kind of quick question that can really provoke a thought as, 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 uh, as, a, as it accompanies a, uh, an, ob uh, an image is, is something I'm really looking forward to developing even more. Great. There's a question from Anne Muston. I recently saw figures about the lack of women's art in museums. Is the Fitzwilliam looking positively women artists. Absolutely. Uh, another really crucial um, uh, ingredient. We're, we're lucky. We do have um, uh, some, some um, works by women artists going right back to the 16th century and some of the professional miniaturists who were employed in Tudor England through um, um, 
flower painters like Rachel Roish, all the way to a very distinguished collection by artists like um, Barbara Hepworth and, and Gwen John, and indeed into the, into the present day. But I think that's right. It's important that we represent uh, histories which have been neglected, frankly, for, um, as a result of purely sort of sexist assumptions about whether a great artist should be male or, or female, and and make those um, and make that um, make that our narrative more more balanced. That's not to say women weren't excluded from making works of art, but actually there's much more um, than um, than most mainstream art histories have ever allowed. Even ceramic producers in 18th century England were often, or sometimes at least, women. And so um, I think working with our own collection and also beginning to work with uh, collectors who are focusing on this area. I'm hoping that, to, to your earlier question about 20, 30 years, but actually two or three, we'll have a much more balanced um, history of art that, uh, that is on the walls and in the cases at the, at the Fitz. I'm sure that'll be so. I've got a mind-boggling question from David Berlin, which is about the boggling of the mind. David asks, among the questions you shared with us as to what the purpose of a university museum is, to what extent do you think visual art enables the projection of the individual onto a pseudo-materialistic mesh of reality that could help a better understanding of self and society, e.g. like current suggestions that psychedelic drugs may help us to get free from our ingrained representations of the world? Gosh, that is a that is a tricky question, but actually not a not a I mean, but a but a stimulating one. Um, and I think I guess my way would I would answer it is that I was uh, I was in recently um, writing to a, a friend who talked about how the surrealism of, of daily life was countered by a kind of order um, and a ways of, of seeing clearly that works of art um, can provide. The great artist is a, is a synthesizer, is an observer, is somebody who helps us understand the world that, we're, that we, we exist in and all, all the interrelationships that I was describing in, in our lecture. So there is a kind of, I think there is a sort of jump, an imaginative jump that, that we, we're invited to make when you go into a museum that can actually, in the end, um, help us make sense of our lives in, in, in ways that are rather unexpected. Great. One last question from David O. Do you think NFTs would ever be preserved or displayed in the Fitzwilliam in the future? <laughs> I'm a bit baffled by NFTs, I must admit. Um, there are moments where I feel my age, and perhaps that's one of them. Um, but I think the answer is probably yes. If, if, uh, if, they, if they inhabit a sufficiently important world in our visual realm, then, then yes, they belong in a, in, a, in a museum. Their prices and other things are beyond my comprehension, but the sense that they have a, a value in, in, a, in a project like ours, in, in a kind of archive of the human made, in a laboratory of the material and, and of, of images, the answer has to be yes. On that affirmative ending, yes, uh, I'm now going to draw things to a halt, but I couldn't do that without thanking you, the audience, as well as Luke. I think this has been a great encounter. So thank you so much, Luke, for this Cape Pretty lecture. <laughs>